Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody, especially... Oh, there is some echo, if you could. Uh, especially the... Uh, could you check the echo? There is some echo here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so especially the administrative uh, staff and everybody taking care of everything, the academic, the chairs, for inviting this lecture, selecting this lecture. Uh, okay, so I do not assume anything about the background. All you need that you know what is a group. Okay, um, so this lecture, I will try to make it accessible for this. I do the usual stuff that I took away all the not so relevant stuff from the paper. There are many painful details. I took just what is the heart of the matter. So if you occasionally ask, your, occasionally ask yourself, is this the situation in that system? I read it some time ago. It is not, but you, it boils down to this situation. And this, what I will talk about, is where the breakthrough uh, came. Uh, so a part of this is joint work with Adib Ben Svi and Arkadios Kalka, especially the last part of the talk. OK, so uh, very, very roughly, I can say, we, we can say, claim that uh, public cryptography, the foundations, the building blocks, the problems upon which we are building PKC is uh, mainly abelian. The, the building blocks are mainly abelian. And of course, many people said quantum insecure. So let's take a look. Uh, what we have in practice, we have discrete logarithm problem in finite fields or also in elliptic curves. And uh, factorization. For many, many, many years, we don't have much more than that for, let's say, key exchange protocol or some basic public key cryptography. That's amazing. The reason is still unclear why, why we have basically only these things. Uh, if you want to talk about uh, elliptic curves, this is also uh, a case that you have discrete logarithm problem. It's just another group, but it's still a cyclic group, which is abelian. Everything is abelian, basically. Operations, modulo, a natural number is abelian, addition, multiplication, and discrete logarithm. Uh, elliptic curves, okay, I, I'm, I'm happy encrypting my bank account with the elliptic curves if needed. But uh, I think personally that not enough research was put into cryptanalysis of uh, ECDLP and because it requires a lot of mathematics. This is much the same situation in what I'm going to talk about that in things that in, in areas where there is a lot of mathematical structure but it takes the, the, pay, the pay to get into there is so high, there are not enough people who do cryptanalysis especially not enough mathematicians who are the most equipped uh, about the mathematical part of the, these questions. And uh, we just cannot tell what will happen. We already see that there are some signs that, the, that ECDLP is not exactly like uh, generic uh, groups. And of course, uh, the very hot today uh, assertion that quantum computers break everything classical so, basically we have these options. I'm aware that uh, there are a few more, but they are just in the beginning. I'm talking about options that, let's say, were introduced and began to be studied at least 10 or more years ago. So there are the, abil there is the, ab there are the abelian options, DLP or RSA. There are lattice-based crypto, which I put somewhere in the middle because when you multiply matrix by vector, is it abelian or non-abelian? more tending to abelian in my view, but I put it here in the middle. And there is, the, uh, uh, there are building blocks from non-abelian uh, groups or non-abelian uh, mathematical structures. This is relatively new uh, approach. It was not considered very thoroughly. In fact, it was considered very little. If you count how many papers, how many people worked on it, very little. Okay. So I will talk about the non-abelian option and I claim it must be explored because we are in great luck of difficult, computationally hard mathematical problems to build upon them cryptography. This is also the case in complexity theory where people start looking at non-abelian questions in order to try to extract uh, hard problems. Uh, okay, so if you want to test, uh, to check whether you can use non-abelian groups uh, for uh, cryptography, you also need the good general cryptanalytic tools. 
to assess the security of, uh, of such uh, proposals. So here we will talk about a, a, a general cryptanalytic method that I introduced. Uh, I call it algebraic span cryptanalysis. You will see why later. This method uh, was able to cryptanalyze in a very convincing way uh, essentially all classic, classic, if I can say so, proposals for non-abelian uh, uh, group uh, cryptography or key exchange protocols, but not all, but a good number, the main ones. So uh, first let us uh, talk about conjugation. Conjugation in non-abelian groups. So for G will always be a non-abelian group, means elements do not commute, AC is not equal to CA, and we denote by A to the power C the conjugate of A by C, just this, C inverse AC. This is called conjugation. Uh, conjugation is an isomorphism. It means that it's, it commutes with every uh, group theoretic operation, like multiplication here. You can put it inside. You can put it instead of the, you can swap between it and inversion. So if you invert and then conjugate, it's like conjugating and then inverting. Recall A to the C means this. So it behaves much like exponentiation, but here A and C are both group elements, and this A to the C means conjugation, not exponentiation. So, but this is probably justifies the notation. Now, if there is a word in, the, in variables, for example, uh, this is an example of a word in variables, you can plug in the variables, elements from the group. So, for example, if you plug in uh, conjugates of elements, you can take the conjugate, conjugator outside and you will get the same result because of these two things. So conjugation go outside of inversion and outside of multiplication. So in the end, it will be completely outside of the word. That's a basic property of conjugation in general. Okay, so now I, I, I will introduce you a key exchange that was introduced uh, long ago and it's very interesting because it's completely different than the earlier ideas of key exchanges. It, it uses uh, the fact that the group is non-abelian in a very, very nice way. So Alice, we have Alice and Bob, each of them picks a word in the variables x1 to xk, like we saw before, like x1, x5 inverse, etc. some random word, secret. Red always means secret, green means public, known. Okay. And there, are, there is some non-abelian group, and there are some uh, subgroup, uh, some subgroups of these groups generated each by some elements. Everything here is public. Now, what Alice does, she takes her word in the variables and plugs in the generators a1 to ak, and she gets an element in this uh, generated group, just an element in this group. Let's call it a. Bob does the same, he plugs in these public elements and gets D. So because the words are not known, the resulting elements are also secret. Are known, they are known only to Alice and Bob, respectively. Now, what do they send in the air? So Alice sends uh, the generators for uh, this group conjugated by the secret element. The result of the conjugation is sent. So this is like in a green box. You can see the result of the computation. You don't see what is A. And similarly, Bob sends the conjugates of these elements. So this is it. How do they compute the shared key? And why is it called the commutator key exchange? Let's see. So uh, Alice knows A, and she knows the secret word V. So she can plug in these elements because they are public in the air. Now, we already said that you can take the B outside. You can take the conjugator outside. So let's see what happens. When you look at this, you take the conjugator outside, you, take, you get V of this, which is just A. So you get A inverse A to the B. You can write it explicitly. This is A to the B. And then you can uh, similarly express it in a way that Bob can compute. And the shared key is the commutator of A and B. This is called the commutator. Okay, sorry, I'll maybe leave it a little. So this is the system. Now let us say a few words um, about how to get linear equations from conjugations. So we will always assume that G is a group of matrices 
Why? Because in, in all practical cases, there, there are ways to represent the group in some sense as a group of matrices. I will avoid all these technicalities and just assume outright that G is a group of matrices, n by n matrices over a finite field. So now the elements are matrices. And we are given, let's assume that we are given a conjug an element like this. Someone took a known element B and conjugated it by a secret element A and we know the result. Let's call it C for here. So we know C. Now we can write explicitly B to the A formally is the conjugate of B. We can move A, a to the other side. And this is a known ma matrix. The entries are known. And here the entries are also known. So if we look at the entries of the matrix A and think of them as variables, we get linear equations on the entries of the secret matrix A. So we have linear equations on the secret. Of course, they will not give us the secret because, for example, zero is a solution and A is not non-zero, it's invertible. But anyway, you get linear equations, which is a good thing. Now, if you take a random solution, with high probability, it will be invertible. This is essentially, follow, this follows from the uh, famous schwartz uh, Zippel lemma. So let's take a solution of this system of equations. Let's write it explicitly. Solution means that times this is equal to B times itself. So this is it. Let's put A back here and back here. It means that you can, by solving linear equations, obtain an invertible solution, A tilde, which will behave like red A. This is always possible. So that's the heart of the idea, of, of the basic, that's the key idea of, let's say, in a simple case. Now, what are algebra expands? So, uh, this is our setting, and we know that we can find, uh, given B to the A, we can find some A tilde which does the same job. But A tilde is, okay not necessarily an element of the group G. Here, red A is in G. A tilde is not necessarily in the group G. It's very hard to, to force this because this is not a linear constraint. What we can force is that A tilde is in the span, in the algebraic span of the group G. Look, G is a group of matrices. You can take the linear span, all linear co combinations of elements of the group G, these are just matrices, and you get many matrices, not necessarily invertible, but some vector space. So membership in a vector space is a linear constraint, so you can actually solve these linear equations together with this constraint, and then you guarantee that A tilde is maybe not in G, but it is in the algebra generated by G. This is, uh, this is what you can do and uh, you can do it uh, efficiently, you can compute the algebra generated by G efficiently. So given the group, given the generators for the group G, you can compute by just multiplying and uh, doing Gauss elimination all the time until you get nothing new. So uh, what is algebraic span cryptanalysis in, in a nutshell? It, it uses these ideas. So the general setting is that we are given subgroups, some groups of matrices, so subgroups of this group, and there are secret elements G1 to GK inside these groups, and uh, we have linear equations on the entries of these secret matrices, and we need to find some function of these secret matrices, say the shared key, for example. This is uh, the gen most general problem uh, in this setting. So instead of solving the linear equations subject to this membership, which is infeasible because these are not linear constraints, what we will do, we will solve the equation subject to the linear constraints that we force G1, we cannot force it into the group G1, but we can force it into the algebraic span of G1. So this is what we do. We just solve subject to this relaxed constraints and then this is the funny part then we pray or prove if we can that every solution that we can find every solution to the linear equations that satisfies these constraints actually when we plug it to f we get the same as as if we found the correct solution and plugged it in even though these elements not necessarily are in the groups now i will show you that in the algebraic eraser this is the case in the commutator, sorry, key exchange protocol. What happened there 
is that we were given elements. A was the out, uh, a word in A1 to AK, so it's in this group. B was uh, generated by uh, an element of this group because it was generated by a word in B1 to BK. These were given, A and B are secret. And we are given, so this is the setting, we are given the conjugates of the generators like this, and we want to find the commutator. This is the shared key. That was the situation. So, solving linear equations, we can obtain elements of the algebraic spans of, of these groups. Okay, so not of these groups. We want them to be in these groups, but we cannot. So we force them to be in the algebraic span of these groups. These are linear constraints, together with this system of linear equations. So altogether, this is a system of linear equations. We solve it, and we find elements A tilde and B tilde. We can do it just linear, uh, just Gauss elimination in the end. It's just Gauss elimination. So, because A tilde is generated by A1 to AK, this is a linear combination of products. This is the algebra, okay? And, commu and conjugation commutes, uh, commutes with all the operations. Also, it commutes with addition. What happens is that when you, uh, com let's see, A tilde is some, think about a product, for example. So when you conjugate by A, it will go into the product, so it will conjugate the generators. Let's see, they are here. And therefore, we can replace the red B in the generator level with the blue B. And when you do this, you go outside again, and you get that A tilde to the red B is equal to A tilde to the blue B. It's the same thing. And similarly, you get something for B. And now you can go here and do the computation, and it works like magic. It is actually, it finds the correct key. I do the, I take the commutator of the solutions, not of the secret elements, and it turns out to be the, the secret key, the commutator of the red elements. How could it be? They are outside the group, and the result is in the group. Why? Because we can prove it. We can prove it. Yeah. <laughs> Proof is something strong, yeah. So uh, let, let's, let's take a, a look at this. So uh, this is just conjugation of A tilde. This we know from here that it is this. Now let's write it explicitly. Now you can rephrase, and because this is equal to B to the A, and you rephrase, and that's correct. So very simple. It, it looks like a, a trivial cryptanalysis, and this is the, this is the crypto system, the, the key exchange protocol that survived longest among the non-abelian key exchange protocols. This solution is relatively recent. Okay, and, and it's sort, sort of trivial. Now, this, there was before, I found before this uh, method, before I found the algebraic span cryptanalysis, I used a much more complicated method to, to uh, uh, cryptanalyze uh, this key exchange protocol. Uh, so having yet another method is not so interesting if it's not general. In fact, this method, the algebraic span method, it applied to all major crypto systems, uh, key exchange protocols suggested uh, uh, before it was introduced. So for example, I will show without details because of lack of time, but I also did not plan to give details. This is much more complicated. We found the first cryptanalysis of a certain key exchange protocol that no one had an, an, a clue how to cryptanalyze it. In any method, heuristic, ad hoc, provable, whatever. Our, these script analysis are provable. They work in the worst case. You, you cannot foil them by changing the distribution. In fact, we solve complexity theoretic problems. So this is why you cannot foil them. So this is a picture, nice picture, you don't need to read it, of a so-called triple decomposition uh, key exchange protocol. And uh, basically the idea, without reading it, is that you take there is some group and there are pairs of subgroups that commute element-wise. And then you start sending in the air products of secret elements. Now, it is not a big problem when you have a product of two secret elements. This is not a quadratic, a set of, does not give you quadratic equations because you can move one element to the other side of the equation and get linear equations. The problem is here. This is why it's called triple decomposition. Here, if you move one of the variables to the other side, you still have something quadratic on the other side. And this is why no one succeeded to break it. 
The, the key here was that you can still use algebraic span cryptanalysis. Well, if you ignore these two uh, bits of information, the cryptanalysis failed. We, we actually implemented that. Uh, Kenny Patterson all the time asks if we implemented. We implemented it, it failed. You need to make use of these triple products. So how to do it? You look at the product, for example, this one, you know that, that if, you, uh, if you take this, which is a known element, and multiply it by the group generated by x1 and b1, this is the, these are the groups containing these secret elements, it sort of swallows and you get you get that this uh, affine, affine subspace of matrices actually has uh, only x2 on the outside. This is swallowed inside. And then you can use this in, as a linear equation. You can say that x2 belongs to the corresponding affine space. If you want to, so if you insist to see how looks such an equation, I will show you. But uh, don't say that I didn't warn you. Okay. So you basically do such a, such a computation and you, the constraints will look something like this, that x2 tilde belongs to the algebraic span of a2 t a times this. But this is a known space. Let's look, it, is, it appears somewhere. This is equal to this. So this is known, this is known, this is just a, a shift of a, of a linear space. So it's an affine space, basically. So you get a set of linear equations and with very, very delicate proof, uh, so, yeah. You are done with the time. Okay, uh, so we are <laughs> running out of time. Yes. Please wrap up. Yes, so uh, you can get you, it, it for, you, you get the shared key. So I will just put here the slide of the final comments. And uh, may I have one minute of comments, something, uh, sure. say something? Because this is sort of a, a special field in cryptography. So I think it deserves in this audience to say something. So the methods apply also to other schemes, I said before, but, but not to all of them. And this is not the end of non-abelian uh, cryptography in the sense that it does not apply to some known uh, crypto systems. There are many problems that you can try uh, to build other things. Uh, I assumed that the group has, can be represented as a group of matrices. This is not always the case. And uh, when new systems emerge, the application becomes more and more difficult. So, so there is a lot of room there to, to try and push further and understand what's going on. Why is it not, uh, why is it thus far we have some negative experience with this field? It's because not much effort was put in coming up with good crypto systems. Just there are not enough people who are equ well equipped both with knowledge of non-abelian groups and cryptology. So what, what the message is that we need patience and tolerance somehow to, to let this uh, field uh, develop in some pace that maybe eventually it will help us finding some, some good uh, building stones for, for cryptography. Thank you. We have no time for questions, so please thank us.